How's it going everyone? Hope you guys are doing well. And this is a video that's been a long time coming. A lot of you guys have asked, how do you make the videos? What are some tips and tricks? How'd you do it, Griff? Well, I am finally gonna tell you guys everything that I've picked up, some tips and tricks that I have learned, and you guys can take it with a grain of salt. So I'm gonna break this down into five parts, and there are some things that I'll go a little bit more in depth into, but then there are some other things that I'll leave a little more kind of bland and more, um, I'm not gonna to talk too deep into, is because there are other tutorials that talk more in depth of what I'm talking about. So with that being said, let's just jump right into it. So to start things off, part one is simply have an idea. And so some things to ask yourselves include, what has not been made yet? What has not been out there? Or what is something that someone has partially touched on that you could potentially explode upon and um, really do something good out of it? So those are some things to consider. So like with me, I have been in a huge just what if guy, and I'm curious if anyone has made any theory videos in an NASCAR world, and I noticed no one really did at the time. So that's the route I went, and I had no idea what I was going to be getting myself into, and I just went with it. So one of the things that I do suggest is to simply write it down. Write down your idea, and just keep writing. Just keep writing and keep drawing down different ideas, draw like webs. And a big thing is to think logically in the process, quote unquote. Even though you were getting into like an alternative universe, I still want to think somewhat logically and to think like, if this happened, then something else happened. So one thing I want to share with you guys is this notebook. This journal here is actually all of my notes from the What If Dale Hart Was Still Alive series. One of the things that was rumored in real life was that if Dale Hart was still alive, Kevin Harvick would have driven the 30 AOL car. So I went ahead and did that. But that brings up a new question. So if Harvick is in that ride, where is Jeff Green going to go? And you have to think about this stuff because if you don't, then your timeline or whatever will be very inconsistent. So, I had to think, okay, where's Jeff Green going to go? I decided that Jeff Green was going to drive the 12 car for Penske Racing. He was really good in the Bush series, and Penske is like, okay, we'll, do, we'll give Jeff Green this new shot. But I'm not done, because what about Ryan Newman? Because Newman was supposed to, or he did in real life, drive the 12 car in 2002. What I decided to do is because you can keep doing that loop forever where it's like if this happens then that happens and you can keep going forever but at some point you have to get creative and you have to end that loop and so what I did was I gave Newman a third ride and that's why Ryan Newman stuck with the O2 car throughout the whole Dale Earnhardt series. And so that's something that you have to think about if you want to create your own little timeline, your own little history, whatever. You will have to really put all those pieces together and you gotta be somewhat realistic about it too. As weird as it sounds, even though we're going into a whole nother alternative universe. That's part one, is simply just have an idea and stick with it. And one little side note, and I will say this often, just make it. Just go in and if there are some things that you're not totally like confident in, just go ahead and make it anyway, get some feedback and then start that cycle of constantly getting that feedback so your content can get better and better and better. Okay, so let's move on to part number two, and that is know your programs. So there are seven programs that I use to help me with my NR2003 videos. The first one, of course, is NASCAR Racing 2003, and there's a, definitely a lot that is go, that goes on within the game. And I'll talk about some of those things later in the video. And I do have a link in the description down below if you want to get that game. The second program I use is Photoshop. And I know you can pay like 20 bucks a month for Photoshop, but I'm pretty sure you can get like a cheaper version, or not cheaper, an right? older version of Photoshop for either lower price or free. Photoshop is a whole nother beast, and there are several tutorials out there into how to either paint cars or just the basics behind Photoshop. And there are other programs that you can use like GIMP. I know that some people use GIMP 
to paint their cars. I never use GIMP, but I know that's a other another option as well. Another program I do use is N Ratings. I'll talk more in depth as to how I use N Ratings, but there is a tutorial as well as the link to use N Ratings in the description below. One thing when you need when you download N Ratings is that you will have to register onto the website but it is free and you'll probably just get like one or two emails and that's it. So just go ahead, register, and then you can download and ratings and that is for free. But I do recommend that you guys do donate to the guy who made and ratings for the cost of having that program up because he put a lot of work into it and it, it takes money. So if you guys can, I definitely recommend that you guys should. Another program that I use is called Save Game Editor. Save Game Editor, that is a program that I use to um, have the double file restarts in the 2016 Summer Showdown. And that's the program where you can mess the, uh, or go and play with a starting lineup to whatever lineup you want it to be. And that's another one again, where there is another tutorial on how to set that up. So I won't talk too deep into it, but that's another program that I use. The next one I use is Audacity, and that's actually the program I'm using right now to record the audio for this. Um, Audacity is free software, and this is for if you want to get into broadcasting. Audacity is what I use to record the um, audio footage. And if you want, there are other effects and stuff that you can do in Audacity, but all I use it for is recording stuff. And I'll have a link to that program, which is free in the description below as well. Another one I use is Camera Control Master, which I've talked a lot about. Um, it is very finicky, but you can use it. Um, I recommend that you guys have either Windows 7 or Windows 8 in order for Camera Control Master to really work. Um, but that is also available and I do have a link for that in the description below as well. And lastly, Fraps. Now, Fraps is just a uh, recording software to record stuff that's on your screen. Um, there are other recording softwares out there, but the one I use is Fraps just because it works for me and that's something that I will that I, I trust. So now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty. These are, this is gonna be a little random, but these are some quick notes that I had when working on the Under 2003 videos. Stuff that I picked up, stuff that I um, noticed, and it could potentially help you guys. So, to start things off, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, repetition makes perfect. If you wanna look back at the very first Under 2003 short video I made, it was very debatable, and honestly, if I wanted to, I could delete that, but I it's, it's a, kind of a reminder to myself of where I started and how much I've grown since then. Um, and I'll talk more about the repetition thing at the end of this video. Um, the next thing I do want to mention, and actually it's funny, I didn't even put this in my notes, but um, when I was talking about fraps, it kind of brought up into my mind. Um, when you go into Fraps, I highly suggest that you guys do not record the sound that is on the, um, in the Fraps menu, like there's an area where you can record the external sound or internal sound. I have that all off so that when you do record stuff on Fraps, you do not have any, um, sound and that would actually shrink the files once you record them by a lot. So next one relates to Photoshop. Um, one big suggestion I say for that is, um, and this one is, I'm kind of going a little far with this, but um, we can definitely wrap this back around later. When you make the graphics for Photoshop, so like, 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 like the scoreboard or different like info tracks or something like that, you can work on Wikipedia as a Photoshop file and you can save them as a Photoshop file. But what I suggest is saving them as a PNG file because the size of the file is a lot smaller. We're talking about like megabytes to kilobytes. And when you put it into your video editing software, which I'll talk about later, you are gonna save a lot of power and that'll make your previewing and your editing go a lot more smoothly. And then when you finally render your video, it's gonna be a lot more faster and a lot more efficient versus putting in the PSD file. So the next thing I wanna just talk about briefly is how do I, or how to import cars into NR2003? 
So I'll go ahead and I'll have a couple of screenshots here. And so like, let's just say your car is done. I finished Bubble Wallace's Domino's Pizza car, the car that I made for the Summer Showdown. What you wanna do is you wanna go to File on the top left, and this is for Photoshop. For GIMP, it might be its own different thing. But go to File, Save As, so not Save. Then what you wanna do is you wanna find your Papyrus folder, which is usually in your uh, Windows. And then you find your folder that says Papyrus, NASCAR Racing 2003. And then go to the folder that says Exports underscore Imports. And then there, your file name will be whatever you want it, just so that you remember it, remember it. Then you go to Format on the bottom, and then find where it says Targa, or TGA. And then you will go ahead, excuse me, and click Save. And then it'll take a little while to load up. And then it'll have a little preview thing saying Targa Options, Resolution, and if you have a good, strong, powerful computer, I suggest doing 32 bits per pixel. But if your computer is not as strong or it can't, it can't hold that power, you can go ahead and do 16. But I would say if you want to have good quality um, cars, go ahead and do the highest. So once you're done there, what you want to do is go into your game, NASCAR Racing 2003, and I hope you guys enjoy the uh, barking of the dog. So you'll get into your game, NASCAR Racing 2003. Um, and then what you wanna do is, oh boy, that's fun. Okay. So you wanna go into Opponent Manager in NASCAR Racing 2003. Then over on the driver's side, you wanna click New. And then in File Name, you wanna type in whatever it is. So 43, Bubba. Oh, that's nice. And then you click OK. And then you have this blank car. One thing I did want, I do want to mention though, when you are creating a new car, um, make sure you saw the manufacturer on the bottom that it matches. So if you're doing a Chevy, make sure it's connected with a Chevy, Ford, Ford, Dodge, Dodge, um, Toyota, Toyota, etc. Then what you want to do is go to import on the bottom right, and then find the name of the car that you just or the um, file that you just created. Click OK, and it'll take a second to load up. And then it's there. It's all pretty. It's all ready to go. And then on the top right, you'll then do first name, last name, type in a number, sponsor, and team. And this is only with the car. You can do a separate thing with the uh, pit box, but I personally never got into that. And that is something that um, you can definitely invest into and just to make it all the more realistic. Um, and well, you can go from there. So that is how you import your painted cars from Photoshop into NASCAR Racing 2003. Um, so another area that's a little bit finicky but I do want to talk about is the track INI folder. So where you go to find that is again, if you go into your Windows, Papyrus, NASA Racing 2003 folder, go to the bottom where it says tracks, and then you want to find the track that you want. So for example, let's go to the Talladega default folder. And then you'll have this little notepad. And so the INI, it opens with notepad. And so here you'll have all the information, the name of the track, the all the information. And so if you and so a couple of little things to look at. First of all, with the vault event laps. So for example, if you wanted to do the thing with double file restarts, uh, this is where you would go to change how many laps the races are. And so you can go from 188, and you can go down to 60, you can go up to 500, you can do pretty much whatever you want. Um, some other things that I messed around with is down on the bottom you have track asphalt grip and track concrete grip. That's just how successfully do the car stay on the track. And one little thing that I kind of work with is the concrete grip is more of like the outer lanes. And I don't know why it's asphalt and concrete, like I, I don't know the physics or science behind it. But what I am usually notice is that when the concrete grip is a little higher, um, cars on the outside lane are able to do a little bit more fairly on the outside versus being on the inside. And one little tip, when if, if slash when you go ahead and mess around with this, 
I suggest you hardly move it at all. Like, oh, three one hundredths, at max five one hundredths, because if you go and make like a massive change, it'll really mess with the entire track file. And, when, and on top of that, what I also suggest as well is to go ahead and um, make a copy of the track file, the track INI file, so that if you do mess up, you do have the original to revert back to. So you have the asphalt grip, you have the concrete grip. Um, whether you can mess with that, you can make it ice cold and it'll actually make the cars go a lot faster. Uh, but the one I mess with the most is the AI track because that's the type of cars I work with the most and that is the AI. So stuff I mess with including the XL modifier, like how fast does a car accelerate? Same with decelerating, like how fast does it brake, if at all. Grip modifier, how fast does a car go in the turns. Drag modifier, how fast does it go on the streets. And that's one where if you turn it down, it will go faster in the streets. Um, but if it goes a little higher, etc. AI line is one that is very finicky. And if you do end up messing up, you mess up very hard. And that's simply how how deep does a car go like balls of wall into a turn. Um, and then you got the uh, other things. And on the right, it gives you more of a description of what each of the things are. And one last note I do want to mention here is I don't share any of my changes because I greatly respect the people who created the tracks in the first place. And I don't want to, you know, call it my own or anything like that. And I don't want to like, you know, share that. One other thing that I want to mention is um, going back to the save game editor. There are tips and tutorials on how to get that all set up. And again, the reason why I use that is so like I do the double file restarts. So big area to where I did that was the 2016 Summer Showdown. You saw that all the restarts were double file. Um, and so some things to keep in mind include if a car is super damaged, do you want it cleaned up so that it is good to go? Or is it so damaged that it is technically out of the race? Um, and then also consider how many laps to go is in the race. And ratings, I'm not going to talk about too much just because, again, there are other um, tutorials on how to set that up. But long story short, that is what I use to um, make the cars, like, realistic, if you will. So, like, being sure Dale Earnhardt was good and other drivers not so good. Um, and keeping it, you know, realistic. And then the big question is um, drivers that were not like in that series at that time in real life. For example, the 2018 Summer Showdown, how did I get rating for like Natalie Decker and Haley Deegan and whatnot? What I did was I based it off of a driver that was on there. So for Haley Deegan, for example, I believe I used Martin Truex Jr. from 2018, but I went ahead and I adjusted some of the numbers on the right side to kind of reflect more of her driving style. So like I know that she's great on short tracks, but not so good on like speedways and super speedways. And that's just because she's never been on one before. So again, it's just an idea of like having her or your person reflect off of someone else that actually does have the stats that you want that person to have, but then make those sweet slight tweaks so that it makes their own identity it makes their own person and just a little side note if something is confusing or something i say doesn't make sense go ahead and ask for clarification in the comments section below before i talk about actual recording i wanted to talk about broadcasting and actually running the race big thing that i picked up recently is broadcast the race live so record audacity beforehand and then jump right into the race and record it as if it's live because then your reactions to whatever happens is a lot more genuine. And I also enjoyed doing those races that way because again, I had no idea what to expect because if I did the race beforehand, it's like then I'd have to act like I'm surprised and it just does not feel as realistic. So now the race is done. You've, you have the race, you are ready to record, you're ready to move on to the next step. So the first big thing that I say is to record slow. And this is actually someone I picked up from TNT Man 93. So what I do is depending on the track, I record all of my footage at either three to five times 
slower than normal pace. That is a big reason why my videos take so long to make. And so if you want, you can go ahead and record them at normal speed, but it would look very glitchy. And if you especially use Camera Control Master, there's a good chance you can miss whatever action you want to shoot. When it's slower, you have a lot more control. You're able to focus on whatever is you want in frame. Again, the big downside is that it does take a lot of time to get those races done. And that's a big reason why the 2018 Summer Showdown took as long as it did. In an upcoming video, I talk more about why the 2018 Summer Showdown took as long, but we're not talking about that now. You wanna take your time with that. And then with Camera Control Master, that's another thing that it just takes repetition and just being comfortable with hitting that delete key, letting the camera loose, and then putting it in places that you would think camera people would be. And so what I would suggest is that on some tracks, uh, the original creators put like camera people. What I would say is put your camera right where the camera people are and go ahead and zoom in and try to frame your shots just like you would see it in a NASCAR race. And since I've watched NASCAR for over 20 years, I have a strong idea of where the cameras are, and that just comes a little more naturally to me just because I've done it, or, or I've done it and I've seen it for so long. And then one little side note, just if you want to get really um, deep quality-wise, the, uh, the one that's on pit lane one, the one where you hit the lead, that would be, I would use for more wider shots where you want to get more of the cars. But if you want to get those close shots, like the ones where the camera is like on the wall, what I use is the pace car. And this is only like in green flag, like if the um, pace car is not going to move. Go to that and then um, use the roof cam where you hit the insert key. And then it's going to be a lot slower. But once you get the camera mounted, it's there and you can get as close to the car as you want without having it glitch out. So that is what I use to get those good close shots without having the camera, you know, go in. You got your recording, you got your stuff, it's taken a while, but it's finally done. You finally have all the stuff that you want recorded and you've done your broadcasting and you're good to go. So now let's move on to part number four. So the next part is video editing. So going into the editing software and so how I'm going to talk about this and how I'm going to explain this is more kind of openly because I know that there are several different video editing softwares out there. I, for when I did a majority of my Android 2003 work, I did it on Sony Vegas Pro 13. I have just switched over to Adobe Premiere, but I also know other people use um, After, or not After Effects, I'm sorry, Final Cut Pro. And then I also know people used um, Windows Movie Maker as well. And then I know there's a bunch of other video makers as well. So I'm not gonna talk in depth about a specific video editing um, software. I'm just gonna talk more just openly. And then if there are confused about how to like, for example, do color correction, um, there, are to, there, are, there should be tutorials on YouTube on how to do such a thing. And so that's really the biggest thing is tutorials are your best friend, but I just want to again give you kind of like my point of view, my tips and tricks on doing this specific type of content. So to start things off, cross dissolves are nice, but don't do them all the time. The big thing with cross dissolves, I really use it for two areas. One is for like the starting lineups. When you go from one group of cars to the next group or next pair, Instead of doing a hard cut from one to two, I do a cross dissolve just because it flows more smoothly. And then the other time I use cross dissolves is if, there, if um, time, if a bunch of time passes by. So a big example, going back to the 2018 Summer Showdown, is if there's pit stops and I wanna go to one to go before the restart, I do a cross dissolve. And the reason I do a cross dissolve is it shows that some time has elapsed and I mean, I could go ahead and I could do and show some stuff um, in the two laps or whatever, but I usually don't. And I know you guys want to get right to the racing action. And so that's why I do the cross dissolve and I jump from pit stops to one to go. The second thing is audio. And I want to talk about audio specifically. First of all, music. 
I know that a lot of you guys like using music um, and during your intros or outros and it's like you're talking with the music. Some people are pretty good with this, but I also know there are some other people where it's like it's a battle and it's like the music wants to go and compete with your talking. And so like for example right now, I don't hear it now, And the big reason why is that the music is still there, but it does not compete with your talking. Your talking is still the focal point and people still want to listen to that. The music kind of adds to the ambiance of whatever you're saying or whatever moment is shown. And then another thing too with talking as well, and I'm actually doing this right now, what I suggest is when you do your broadcasting, have the audio a little lower than what you want it to, because I know there are some people that like have it pretty high or on auto, and when you like talk really loud, then um, there's like popping noises and your mic crackles, and it does not sound professional or good. So what I do is I purposely have it down a little way, so like if you yell, it gets you know somewhat high, but then in post when you do your video editing, I bring that a little higher, so that it all. Um, works out and so it's loud but it's not you know crackling or popping or anything like that and then and then the other thing then too is the uh, race card noises that I use so I've used a bunch of real life noises and this is one this is one of the harder things I would say to make working on the videos was trying to connect the race car noises to uh, my footage and I would say my your best friend would be the crank it up on Fox at least back in the day, they were really good about having just pure gnat sounds. Nowadays, I cringe every time I hear like um, communication between a spotter or whatever, and I don't know if they're trying to like enhance it by hearing what the spotter says, but sometimes I just want to hear the gnat sounds, or the natural sounds of the cars. So that, that that's one thing where there's no like, there's no one area for me to go and find the footage you will have to do some searching. And so one example in my most recent Intertossal 3 short analyzing the big one, I actually had to scrub through the entire 1998 UAW GM Quality 500 at Charlotte, and I tried to find like some pure noises. And so I was really lucky when, uh, when Dale Earnhardt crashed in the short, the audio I used from that was when Bobby Labonte crashed in the race at Charlotte. And what was really cool is that for the most part, the um, audio did sync up, but I did have to move a couple of little clips just to make it sound a little more realistic. So that is a very more advanced thing that I eventually did, and it is time consuming, but if you want to make it good, that is the route that I went with. W one specific part I do want to talk about is like when, the, like when you have those shots where the camera is on the wall, right? and then the car zooms on by and it's like nyong, 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 nyong. Um, couple things on that. First of all, if you're doing like a short track, find one of those where it is at a short track and then speedway, speedway, and then like super speedway, you can probably get one of the nyong, 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 at like Daytona or Talladega. The example I wanted to talk about is um, the summer showdown, the 2018 summer showdown. Um, and I want to talk about the first pass by that I did. So the audio that I used from that was the 2018 Spring Race at Richmond. I used to crank it up, and I had specifically when Kyle Busch passed by the uh, camera. And it was so nice because it was very quiet except for when Kyle Busch passed by, and it was just that one nyum. So I used that, and I took just the audio of just that part. And then if you go back to the 2018 Summer Showdown, that happened like 43 times. And so through three audio layers, I single-handedly put all of those audio pieces with each car that passed. And then once you put it all together, you get something like this. Into the inside for the second position on Christopher Bell, their side. And some things to consider include if you have to like maybe extend one part of an audio clip. And sometimes what I even do too, if like it ends up being super short, what I do is I actually cut it, separate it, and then I kind of like take the ends and put it back together just to make it like work. 
And that's where audio cross dissolves are also really helpful because if you do like a hard cut, it does sound a little awkward. And so cross dissolves would also be your best friend there. And then the last thing in terms of the audio is your broadcasting. There will be some times where your broadcasting isn't, um, it doesn't line up with your actual footage. And there will be some times where it's like, some footage will be happening and then what you say comes like maybe one or two seconds afterward. My advice is if there is any dead air that you find in your uh, footage, cut that and then merge that like together. So then the audio lines up more coherently. So now we're gonna talk about kind of how I go about editing a typical NR2003 video. And I, I guess I'm gonna go more route of the shorts because the uh, Summer Showdown and the theories, that kind of has its own like ship. So again, I'm just talking more like a short. So you have your raw files and just as a little side note, I, 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 know, I completely missed this but um, at the beginning, but when you record your um, footage, make sure you record it to a hard drive because then the footage is a lot more smooth and um, you are recording a lot of data. And so you would rather have more space on a hard drive than trying to take the risk on a laptop. So I would definitely advise in investing in a hard drive. So anyway, what I did is with all the footage, and so again, all this footage is slow. So again, four times its normal length. What I did is I put all those clips onto my timeline. And there are three things that I usually do to those original clips. And those three things are speeding up the footage, levels, and color correction. I don't worry about graphics. I don't worry about um, audio at this round. That is the second round of editing. So in this first round, what I do is speed up the footage. So because as I remember, we recorded it at you know quarter speed. So if you can find a way to speed up to like 400 or 500 percent, depending on how realistic it looks, um, go ahead and make sure you do that. And then if you do have any access like footage, make sure you cut that out. And actually, one thing I want to mention before I continue forward, going back to when you record, like especially on Camera Control Master, make sure you give yourself a little bit of space before and after every clip. So like, for example, when a car goes through, let's say, turn four, for one clip, if you start in turn three and then end at the end of turn four, for the next clip, start at the beginning of turn four and then continue on through so that when you edit it, you can kind of like piece it together so that it seems like one continuous flow. So anyway, with that being said, making sure you speed up the footage. Next thing then is levels. Now levels is just a fancier word for um, contrast. And that is where like you fix how dark the darks are and then how bright the whites are and the lights are. Um, I use levels specifically because I can toy with the dark specifically and then the lights specifically. My big advice on that is unless if it's really, really bad, um, hardly touch it. Like hardly move the, the darks in and I would maybe just start off with like 0.05. But if you want to go in a little bit more, you may go ahead and do so. And then with the lights, same thing, like you don't want too much. But the reason I do it is just to give more of a stronger contrast just so that visually it looks more appealing. And then same thing with color correction. And again, this is something I hardly touch, but if I wanted to add a little more, like for example, if it's a warm day or a warm night, I would shift the color correction and I'd usually do the um, middle one, not the highlights or shadows, but the middle. And I would shift that to more of a red, just to kind of give that sign that it's a little hot out. And then like if the sun is like setting, I'd maybe shift the colors more to red and yellow, but I wouldn't like shift it all the way so that it's like all red and all yellow. So unless you're doing something that is, um, but if you're trying to make like an art piece or something like that, that's like really out there, you're more than welcome to do so. But in terms of realism, you can go ahead and mess with it a little bit, but do not go crazy with that. So another question that comes up is why are you doing this here and why aren't you doing, um, all of it in one round. Biggest thing is it's a safety precaution because all the clips that you're using are from the hard drive. And so if your hard drive messes up, 
then your footage is gone. So what I do is I do it all there and then I'll render just that footage. And again, no graphics and no audio pieces, just the footage. And depending on how many clips you use, you can, it'll take maybe minutes, but it could take up to an hour, depending on how much footage you have, and then also how powerful your computer is as well. So once that is rendered and that's all taken care of, then we can move on to the second round of editing. And once you look at the footage and you see it's all good to go, then you can delete all the clips that you have on your hard drive so that you can free up some space. Unless if you want to keep it just kind of as a safety precaution, you're more than welcome to do so, but I usually delete mine after I have it rendered on the first go round. So after all that, let's me then move on to the second round and that's where the entire video comes together. So that's when the audio pieces come together, so the music, the commentary, the race car noises are all come in. Uh, that's when the graphics come into play and some of the quick tips for graphics is simply don't make it too big, don't make it too annoying. Um, for the whites, like if you have a graphic that's white, don't have it be super white, like 255, 255, 255, which is on the color palette. Make it a little gray because if it is super white, it super stands out. So a little gray, so like 244 is what I use. Um, so. 250 or 244 and then also graphics I usually have out and depending on how much information is on the graphic four to five seconds but if there is more information I would say maybe like eight seconds but usually four to four or five seconds and then usually I do a fade fade in fade out on the graphics um yeah and then it's just a matter of putting all the pieces together and then you do a final render and it's good to go and then once it's good to go, then you upload it to YouTube, have a witty title, have a little description of what the video is about, have links and resources to what you um, use to work on it, and go from there. And your first Intercalls 3 video is complete. One thing I do want to mention though, before going to part five, which is kind of just wrapping things up, um, the, last thing, or the last thing I want to mention is frame rate. So what you're watching right now is 24 frames a second. And that's kind of like the movie frame rate. That's like when you go to the movie theater, that's the frame rate you for the most part see. 29 is kind of like if you watch an old race, that's the frame rate that you usually see. And then 59 is like the real life. And if you look across all my Intertals 3 videos, I play with all the different frame rates, 24, 29, and 59. And I personally like 24 the best, but if you like 59 more, or if you like 29 more, you're more than welcome to play with whatever. The last thing I want to talk about is publish, publish, publish. I cannot express enough that like there are a lot of people that like think they created something great, including myself with One More Spark 1987, but it never gets published. What I strongly advise is even if it is something you're not entirely impressed with or that you're entirely pleased with, I highly suggest that you publish it anyway, because you don't know if it's good until you actually publish it. Um, and then it's another thing then too is being open to uh, suggestions, critiques, um, just asking people, what do you think? And I think it's very important that you do reach out. Not everyone will respond back, but the people that do, um, you would probably have to suggest, or I would suggest is a very good connection. And that's, again, kind of the route that I'm gonna go with as I transition into my new um, role, if you will. I still wanna help those, um, like, create their own Inner Charleston 3 shorts or worlds or theories or whatever. Um, so if you do have something that you want me to see or check out and give me my thoughts or whatever, hit me up on either the DMs on social media or email at griffin8fan at gmail.com and we'll go from there. Because again, I wanna help that. I said that in the retirement video. A big thing to just to end on is that your first, your first videos will suck. And I actually wanna go back and I wanna talk about 
some of the first videos that I made on NR1003. But I really didn't go anywhere until maybe the sixth NR1003 or seventh NR1003 shark shush. So let's go to. Yeah, the seventh NR1003 short because I had a bunch of other ones that I kind of just made for fun. And um, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I was just making some fun little videos using Camera Control Master. And again, it was at a time where I was very scared to be in front of the mic. And you can even hear it in the fourth one where I had the 2012 Cup guys at um, blah, 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 Road America. And that was the very first time I did any form of broadcasting. And not gonna lie, it was terrifying and it was very cringy. But instead of stopping, I kept going, I kept making content, and here we are. So, and that's kind of the route I'm going with as a little teaser to what's next. Like, I'm kind of stepping back to day one again in a different field because I know that it's a whole different area. Um, so in a way, I'm kind of joining you guys on that adventure, starting over day one, learning a lot, doing a lot, trying to prove myself again. Um, so yeah, it, that's the biggest thing is to embrace your failures, learn from them, and just know that every failure is an experience. And the worst thing that they'll say is just no. It's not like they're like, I'm out and like hurt you or anything like that. So yeah, if anything um, tickles your fancy or if you have any questions or suggestions or comments or whatever, go ahead, go ahead and put that in the comment section below and we'll go from there and as i said i have resources to all the other stuff that i use in the comment section below as well um and i think that's it yeah just do it just start making content that's all i say that's all i suggest so okay i'll stop here thank you guys so much for watching and this is griffin spear saying so long until next time